OK. Hello. Good afternoon. So I think we're, yeah, nice audience here. Let's get started. So today I'd like to talk about, well, that's not a big surprise. I'd like to talk about search. And I know this is a Drupal event, but I'd like to take a step back for a minute and uh, yeah, take a look at the bigger picture and see what are the expectations of our users when it comes to search. First example, you're probably familiar with it, Wikipedia. When you start typing in the search field, what you get there are suggest, oh, sorry. There. So when you start typing there, you get suggestions for, um, well, for the article that you're probably looking for. And when you select, you select that suggestion, it will be, uh, you will be taken directly to the article page. You still have the possibility to have the traditional full text search, but when you know what you're looking for, you will probably never end up on that page. We still have a couple of seats here in the front. Another example on Amazon, you're probably also familiar with this one. When you start typing, you also get suggestions. But here, the suggestions are of a different kind. Here, you don't get suggested results. You get suggested search queries. And you see for the top searches here, you even get a category that's associated with that suggestion. And when you select it, it takes you to the search result page with that facet pre-selected. On Spotify, there again, you have an autocomplete. And that autocomplete contains a lot of different kinds of results. You have tracks, you have albums, you have artists, and pretty much anything that you could be searching for on Spotify, you will find it in that autocomplete. And there is a search result page, but in practice, you never need it. On GitHub, the search by default is limited to the, to the project that you're currently looking at. So you have the possibility to make a global search that really, um, sorry. So you have the possibility to make a global search that searches through the entire data set, but by default, you are limited to just that project which you're looking at. On Stack Overflow, there to the search is nothing like really fancy, no fancy widgets, but when you search, the default sorting is by relevance. And relevance is actually a combination of multiple parameters. And you see that you can actually sort uh, the results in different ways. For example, for the, the most recent ones, in case you want to answer questions that were recently asked, you can also click on a tag. And it's also the search system that powers like the, the listing of a specific tag. So you see that it's not only about searching, it's also about finding data and querying the data in multiple different ways, sometimes structured, sometimes unstructured. So what can we learn from these examples? Well, the first thing that we can learn is that there is no one size fits all when it comes to search. Every project has different data, different users with different needs. And if we want to match the needs of these users, we need small adjustments in the right places. And these are spread throughout the technical stack starts at the front end with different search widgets, different business logic for how you use the facet, uh, different styling for the search result. Also at the application layer, you will be building different kind of queries. You, build, you will be preparing the data uh, to, to give exactly what your application needs. And then at the storage level, you need to have a dedicated system that, that will actually read the data fast enough, uh, oftentimes on like millions of entries and terabytes of data, uh, to really give the performance that is needed. The other thing that we can learn from all these examples, well, all of them are built on Elasticsearch. Actually, all of them with one exception. And that exception is uh, the Amazon example. And the reason why I pointed out is because a lot of people, when they hear about Elasticsearch for the first time, they think, hey, Elasticsearch, that must be an Amazon service, kind of like Elastic Computing Cloud. But no, Elasticsearch is an open source project just like Drupal. So talking about Drupal, what does search look like in Drupal? Well, there is um, a search module in core 
it's enabled by default, so it must be good, right? Um, and so it lets you search for content. Um, and yeah, well, it lets you search for exact matches of content um, and exact matches of content that were created before last time cron run. Um, and you also have an advanced search. Um, no comments there. And actually, that, that search, it, it doesn't look so bad. But in terms of how it works, um, it works pretty much the same thing, uh, the same way as this one does. Do you know what this is? <laughs> Drupal 4.7. Oh. <laughs> uh, so if we take a, <laughs> take a look at the, the, the change log looking for search, um, we see that uh, here uh, with the release of Drupal 4.7, that was the last time that any significant changes were done to the system. Uh, just to put that into context, when Drupal 4.7 was released, these devices here, they did not exist. And uh, this website here was still very cool. <laughs> so if you... <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so if the search is relevant and important to your site, uh, don't use the core search. But um, the, the core search is not the only option that we have, and chronologically, uh, the next one that came along was um, Apache Solar. And Apache Solar um, was, well, the, the idea was started, among others, by, the, by this guy, Robert Douglas, many years ago. The idea is to use the uh, open source search engine, Apache Solar, and to combine it, in, to integrate it in Drupal with the module of the same name. Um, so the module actually offers a good amount of functionality. Uh, that's from the official module page. But really, the main selling points were, well, it's fast. It's really fast. And search is a technically challenging problem. And if you want to solve it with the right performance, then you need to have a dedicated system. The second one, it does proper text analysis means that you can do stemming, you can do fuzzy searches, all these things that provide tolerance towards your users to provide really like satisfying user experiences that are not uh, frustrating your users. And then we have the big selling argument, Facet. And Facet is not only the widget where you have the, your links in the sidebar, it's really this concept that you search, we start a search with just a couple keywords, and then you get a lot of results, way too many results. You just go through them by hand. And then you have facets that let you iteratively refine your search, re your result set uh, down to exactly what you want to look for. And this is great, but somehow as a community, we got stuck on this idea that um, <laughs> facets are the essence of a powerful search. And don't get me wrong, facets are great. They're definitely a very useful concept, use very useful widget but it's not the end of the story. And I think that maybe things like text analysis might be much more important to provide good search experiences, but it's all happening under a hood, so this is not really fancy. This is nothing to show to clients. It just, it's one of the things that is a little bit of magic. Maybe we should understand it a little bit better. And of course, I can't talk about search in Drupal and not mention the search API. So there was a dedicated session on that, so I'm not going to go into detail. But in short, Search API lets you integrate a lot of different search backends and use them with site building tools to build views and different kind of uh, flexible search results. Um, so it, it's a very good project, uh, project. We've used it on a lot of, of uh, client cases and built some really cool stuff with it. But I have a couple of issues with it. The first one is that it's an abstraction of solar. That means that you can do everything that you can do with solar with other search backends if they support that, but you can't do anything that solar doesn't let you do. The second one is that it's all based on configuration. So that's great because it means that as a site builder, you can do everything through the browser. You just click around, you, you do your thing, but at the same time, there are certain tasks that are better solved with code than with configuration. And I personally believe that search is one of those. The third point is that it is hard to customize because if you want to get to the small details that really make the difference between a search that, that works and the search that people really feel that it works, 
um, you have to go through the search API hooks or API, so the search API API, and then through that you can reach into the API of their underlying system, which can be sometimes quite awkward and make simple tasks a little bit more complex than they need to be. But I'm not here to complain about search API. What I'd like to do is I'd like to show you maybe an alternative. And this alternative is Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch, the first contact that I had with it was a couple of years ago on a project on which we used Drupal and Node.js uh, to talk to Solar. And we had some pretty complex integration there. And at some point in the project, we realized that we had some, some major issues with Solar, namely like deadlocks around uh, deployment and uh, like downtimes with reindexing. And we, we decided to give Elasticsearch a try. And to our surprise, well, we were able to switch over within like around a day um, and we never looked back. And it was, yeah, it just worked. And I'm not here to, to just tell you why Elasticsearch is better than Solar, um, but you can just look at Google Trends I know Google Trends has to be taken with a grain of salt, um, but there is definitely a trend there that's difficult to deny. So what are the selling points of Elasticsearch? Um, well, there's a lot of them. Um, if you look on the Elasticsearch website, there's plenty of great explanation. But I think that there is one point that is really important um, and is very relevant to us as Drupal developers and the kind of use cases that we have in combination with Drupal. And that's a developer-friendly RESTful API. Developer-friendly means that it is an API that is nice enough to work with that we want to work with it. We don't want to hide it behind some kind of abstraction layer. And also, it's a RESTful API, mean, meaning that it, is, it works the same way uh, as the stuff the, that we do on a daily basis. So it will be familiar to, uh, to you if you're a web developer. So fast forward a couple of years later, so last year in the fall, we had a customer that came to us with a relatively simple project. They wanted an intranet. And this intranet had to be extremely simple. It had to be minimal. Uh, but one of the things that it had to do, it needed a search. And that, um, that search, it just had to be, again, very simple. You start typing anywhere on the, on the intranet and it searches through users, it searches through content, it also searches through the company calendar that's like hosted elsewhere and that we get through an API. Uh, so it had to be quite powerful. And at that point, while well, the project was on Drupal 8 uh, with an Angular front end, and uh, the search API was not really stable enough there, especially, especially the Elasticsearch integration. Uh, so we decided to build a simple solution directly using Elasticsearch. And this is uh, what we got. So here, this is not the, the actual internet, but uh, kind of copy with fake content. Um, so when you start typing, um, you just search through everything. You see there is, there's error correction. Uh, when you select something, you just jump th directly through that user profile. Uh, if you're looking for content instead of looking for users, you also have very similar experience. Um, and so it's simple, it works, the users were really happy about this. So how did we go about building this? And how can you build this too? So the first thing is that we did, that we, did we installed Elasticsearch. Um, that's pretty easy. You get it, you unzip it, and you run it. In real life, you will probably want, on a, well, on a real project, you will want to use a, a package manager, so app get or whatever, uh, or you maybe a Docker image. But if you just want to try it out. Hmm? No. Well, in, if you want to have it in production with high availability, yes. So you will, you will want that kind of setup. If you just want to try it out, you can actually do that under a minute, which you can't say about uh, most search systems. Um, and then we want to talk to Elasticsearch. So it's running, but we want to talk to it from our PHP code. And there's an excellent PHP library uh, oh. from Elastic. Um, and since everybody here is using Composer to build their Drupal 8 project, right? Uh, the, you only need to run that one command. So you install like 
yeah, the, the Elasticsearch client. And so now we're done with the setup, we can start uh, indexing. So how do we index things? Um, well, you use your good old hook entity update, and there you instantiate your, your client. In this case, I'm just calling the, the library directly. Of course, you would like wrap this in a service and, um, and use dependency injection to get it. But um, yeah, so this is just a minimal amount of code to get things working. And here on the client, we call the index method, and we specify that we want to save data in a, in a content index. Um, and the type is article, and the, the type is very vaguely to, uh, to an index what a table is to a database in terms of MySQL. Then we specify an ID, just so that we can refer to that entry later on. And then for the body, uh, well, we just submit the entity object as is. And um, actually, the great thing is that it works. This is what you then get into your, your search index. <coughs> The not so nice thing is that what you get in your search index is this. Um, you might recognize this structure. This is the same structure that you get from the, the standard REST API without any modification with Drupal core. So the, the node ID is an array that contains object. Uh, these objects have value property, which is a string, and in that string you have a number. Um, that's not the kind of data that you want to have in your JavaScript front-end, for example, and it's also not the kind of data that you want to have in your search index. So we're going to revise this a little bit. So on entity save, then we run through the, the serializer using the ser serializer API from Drupal core. We define a custom normalizer, uh, and it's that data that we then put into Elasticsearch uh, with something that will look like this. And here we have, like, like we're fully free to define our own structure. Uh, but you can specify really anything. So you have, uh, you have strings, you have objects, you have numbers, um, and Elasticsearch will actually take that data and create a schema out of it. So you don't need to explicitly specify like, what your data structure is going to be. By default, you just send an object and it will just take that. So that's great. It, it really means that you can get started very quickly, but there are some cases where you want to specify, like, not what data that you have, but really, like, what this data represents. Um, and you need to do that so that Elasticsearch will be able to better handle your data. For example, we have a created property which is quite common on entities. It's a timestamp. And a timestamp is a number. And so if you index that, Elasticsearch will say, okay, that's a number. But we need to specify that it's a number that represents a date. Um, and so what we do, we specify that it is a date and the format is epoch seconds, so Unix timestamps. For the, the content field, well, it gets recognized as a string already, but we want to tell Elasticsearch, hey, this is English. Please parse this as English, or Finnish, or German, or Chinese. Uh, there's actually built-in support for, like, actually, well, built-in support for uh, all the, the Western languages, or really most of them, um, as well as support for like um, Asian languages uh, through through plugins, so that's that's something that kind of yeah comes out of the box and it works very nicely. And then uh, there are other fields. For example, the image URL it is a string, but we don't want to analyze it. We don't want to know what are the words in that URL. So we tell Elasticsearch not to analyze it. So now we have our content in Elasticsearch structured properly. And now we just need to do the last step is we need to start searching. And searching is also very simple. You have your client and then you call the search method and there um, you can specify what index you want to search on. You can even specify multiple ones. For example, uh, we want to search on content uh, and we want also to search users. And there um, we have a, a query language that's structures as, as JSON or in this case, PHP objects or PHP arrays that uh, get converted to JSON. Um, and in this case, we do a multi-match because we want to search in multiple places. We search for whatever the input we get from, like for example, the controller where you put this code. Of course, this input has to be escaped. So make sure that you put uh, proper security measures into place. Don't copy code from these slides and deploy that in production, please. 
Um, and uh, we specify what fields we want to search on. So in this case, we search on the label. Um, and because we want search as you type functionality, for example, for the, the, data, uh, the data that we get for the autocomplete, um, we also searched through another version of that same label field that is indexed differently uh, as an autocomplete, meaning that you get partial matches. And what we're doing here with this like hat uh, five, it means that we are boosting the label. So we will get a result if we have a partial match or a complete match, but we, if we do get a complete match, then this will be ranked uh, higher. Also because we want to be tolerant to our users, we <coughs> specify some fuzziness. So fuzziness is typically a number, and it represents the number of characters that can be off when you're like mistyping something. But if you specify auto, it will automatically increase the longer your input. So that means that if you s type a s short word, you might be allowed one or two typos, and if you type something like a whole sentence, then maybe even 10 characters might be off, and that would be fine. And then we have a small but very important detail. That's the prefix length. And the prefix length means like, how many characters from the beginning of the input will not be allowed to be fuzzy or to be wrong. And this is really important because when well, we didn't have this at first, and then when we, uh, when we removed it, well, when we didn't have it, we had this problem. Uh, so you start looking for your friend or your colleague, Tony, um, and then you have a couple search results like Tony and Tommy. And Tommy, it, yeah, it actually makes sense because, you know, it's just one letter off. Uh, that makes sense. But Johnny is also one letter off, and that search result, that, that suggests it somehow looks wrong. And the reason is that, well, when we mistype something, usually we don't mistype the first letter. It's always later on in the word. And also, the way how the brain works, um, we give a lot more importance to the first letter of the word uh, as to, to the, the, the remaining ones. So we want to make sure that this last result, that we're not going to have it, because even though it is correct, it doesn't feel right to the user. And when we're building this kind of suggestions to the user, we want to make sure that like, the suggestion is not the place to like, give interesting stuff to your user. The suggestion is the place where you just give the user what the user ex expects, which is a different strategy than what you use then for the search result page when you do the, the full text search. So this is what we built. And it actually worked out really nicely. The customer was very happy. Uh, the team was very happy. Uh, the project was launched on time and under budget, um, and we decided to like, try this uh, approach for other projects. So here's another project. Avery is a company that does office supplies, and they have an online catalog. One of the use cases that they have is you buy their product in the store, and then there's a product code on there that you need to enter on the site to get, for example, the Word template that goes along with the, the print-at-home uh, business cards that you got. Um, and so we had a, a support there that you can just type product codes, and product codes are analyzed differently than, than just regular text. So we needed to make sure that these product codes were really understood as one word, not as multiple words, even though they might have hyphens and things like that in it. Um, so that's one of the things that you can do within that search interface, but within exactly the same, same search interface, you can also search for like product types, product attributes. So in this case, uh, business cards that you can print on a laser printer. And the, this data that you get here in these suggestions is actually coming from facets. So it is based on the availability of the product based uh, on, on what you already typed. So how did you build that? Um, we are also doing a search query. Um, in this case, well, the, the project's multi-language, so we are actually having multiple uh, indices per language. Um, and what, we are, uh, what we're doing, we don't actually expect any search results. So we, we, we ignore the search results. We do the search query as usual, so what I showed before. And here we do an aggregation. And an aggregation is the kind of operation that gets you the data for facets, among others. But it's more generic than that and uh, actually lets you do uh, a lot more stuff than, than just facets. And the so we call this aggregation suggested terms. So this is just the name that we decide to give it. And then we use a terms aggregation, meaning that it will return um, the most popular terms. 
the, the field that we use there is the suggestions, um, which is just a, a field that we have uh, where we put all the suggestions in. Uh, and we use the raw version of this field, meaning that it's not analyzed. And the reason we do that is because sometimes we have product categories or product attributes that are made up of multiple words. And we only want to return those as a whole and not as individual words. And to make sure that we only get the data that's relevant to us, we only include those aggregations, so those facets um, that match what the user has answered. Then based on uh, the result, well, we, we have the, our aggregations uh, with the key that we've specified before. And then we just go through each of the buckets um, and we create our response this way. So also something that's quite simple. One interesting challenge that we had uh, that was actually very easy to solve, but uh, something that's a little bit unusual is, well, I think everybody's familiar with paper sizes. Um, and everybody knows that uh, A4 is really the most, com most common paper size. Um, and it means that when you have multiple variants of a product that come in multiple sizes, um, in terms of searching, they're going to all do pretty much like just as well because the description is the same, because the, the attributes are the same, only the size is different. However, like A4 products sell a lot more. So we want to make sure that these will be ranked higher. And this means that uh, to do that, we, we split our query into two parts using a Boolean query. There's the part that must match. Um, so in this case, like the content must match our input. Same thing uh, that we did before. And then we have a should part. And the should is like, it would be great if it did that, but it doesn't have to. So in this case, the, it should match the term uh, field, size, uh, field size should be uh, A4. And um, this, this just gives us like the, just that little boost so that for products, well, different product variants, uh, A4 will always be the first one. And what's interesting here is that, well, this, this example is just a static value here, but there's nothing that stops you from putting other like maybe dynamic data from based on the user profile or maybe based on user history, this is happening not at indexing time, it's happening at querying time. So that you can actually build really powerful personalizations built on this kind of modifications here. Another example that was pretty cool, a colleague of mine built this project. Uh, it's a, a portal for real estate professionals where they can do very fine-grained uh, fine uh, searches with like based on a bunch of attributes, and then the users can save the search. And we wanted to send out notifications whenever there's something new. And what you use there is um, Percolator. So a Percolator is a coffee, kind of a coffee maker from, um, from the 60s that apparently makes really bad coffee. Um, and somehow they used that name uh, for an API um, that actually, it, it, it's something that's really cool. What you do with a, a percolator is that instead of indexing content, you index a search query. And later on, when you index a new document, you can make a percolator query where you say, hey, are there any saved searches for which this document, which I just created, would be a result? And this, it works in a very simple way and also a way that scales really easily. So it was very quick to implement, and also we know that we're not going to have any scalability issues with this. Um, and this kind of issue, saved searches with notification, or otherwise things that really don't scale well at all. After a couple of projects using this kind of approaches, um, a, a colleague of mine said, hey, you know, it's not much custom code for each of these projects, but it is still custom code. There should be a way to, to optimize that. And so we created Elasticsearch Helper. An Elasticsearch helper, as the name implies, it, it helps you, but it doesn't do anything on its own. And the way that you use Elasticsearch helper is you create a, a plugin, a plugin that defines an Elasticsearch index. You specify what the name of the index should be. Uh, you can also use placeholders in there, some pretty cool stuff, uh, the type. And also, you can optionally specify what entity type uh, and even bundle you want to put in the, in the index. And actually, that's all you need to just get started. And we'll, it will actually, this example would 
put nodes into a, a search index. <coughs> and what's interesting here is that all the functionality, all the code that gets executed is in this base class. And if you want to do things differently, if you want to have a slightly different setup, if you want to uh, modify your data before it gets indexed, uh, or delete things in a different way, you can actually just override all the methods of that base class. Um, and that means that, well, and inside of each of these methods, it's just Elasticsearch code that gets executed. So you don't need to learn a new API. You are just using the Elasticsearch API. And this kind of approach has also been used by more people. We, here's another project that, uh, from colleagues in, in Belgium where they are using uh, Elasticsearch uh, and Elasticsearch Helper to build uh, this site that lets users search for, uh, for student housing. Uh, it's making use of Elasticsearch built-in geographical proximity search, um, also a project that actually was pretty easy, went pretty, uh, very well. There's another project uh, that was built by colleagues in Finland that uh, it, it's not launched yet. I can't show it to you, but pretty much it looks like this. Um, it, you, you search for stuff and then you get, uh, you get your search results. And what's interesting, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not Angular, it's not React, it's nothing fancy. It's actually, uh, actually this is rendered as part of a view. And what my colleague did is just to write a small views plugin, which is going to be integrated in Elasticsearch Helper, uh, which lets you perform a search and then s like get the search result from, uh, from Elasticsearch and then render these entities through views. Um, so you still get all the flexibility of views. You can even combine that with other filters. Um, but yeah, it actually works really nicely. So this, this approach is, can really be combined with more traditional site building methodologies if you want. There's one last project that I'd like to, to show. And that project is something that we did for uh, Sportcheck, so a large sports retailer in Germany, um, Germany, Austria, Switzerland. And they also have a big online shop uh, that is actually not built on Drupal. But they have a lot of products and a lot of product categories. And they needed a system to manage all the, that content complexity. And so we built uh, a system that's actually built in Drupal where we pull all the data and we give the user the possibility to, uh, to analyze that data and to, to do bulk operations on, on this large data set. So this listing, for example, um, I know in terms of styling, it's nothing, um, nothing very special. You've probably seen something like, like this before. Um, but uh, this data is actually coming from Elasticsearch. And for a listing like this, it's not really interesting. Um, we can also use like, more fancy uh, interfaces. For example, this, this tree view that really lets the, the editors like, go through product categories and uh, assign bulk operations to them that like, are then dispatched to other users for uh, content creation and moderation. What's interesting here is that, well, the, the first iteration of this, this, uh, this tree was loading data from entities. And after a good amount of optimization to load 6,000 categories, we had something that took about two to three seconds on a, a cache uh, miss. And it's like two to three seconds for something like that. It's, I guess it's, it's OK, but it, it's really not fast. And then we switched to Elasticsearch. And the time to get exactly the same data from, uh, from Elasticsearch was under 200 milliseconds. Um, and actually, a good part of the time was just transferring the data. Um, so it's, yeah, it's faster, 10 times faster in this case. But uh, it, it's not only about providing faster user experiences. We had another challenge in this project where we had to, uh, we had to export like, uh, a CSV file that had like, 32,000 entries. And well, the, when you have entities, you can create a view. And with views, you can create a CSV file. Um, but views really does not work with 32,000 entries. Um, and so what we did, we, we created that CSV file based on Elasticsearch, and we were actually able to do it without having to, to do anything about timeouts. or uh, It actually just worked. And it's not about just being faster, but it's being about being so much faster that you can do things that would otherwise not be possible. So this is an example where we took data from somewhere else, and instead of importing it in data and creating entities for everything, we just took that data and put it straight through Elasticsearch in the format that we wanted. 
um, and this really gives us a lot of performance. And then when we have all the data in Elasticsearch, what we can do, we can simply install Kibana. And Kibana is a data visualization tool that lets you build um, <coughs> graphs and visualizations and lets you combine those in, in dashboards that will update in real time. Uh, it's really amazing tool. It would probably need a, a dedicated presentation. Um, but it's something that we are just putting this, well, we're just putting this in the hands of our customer. And what they can do with this, they can really dig into the data and understand the hundreds of thousands of products that they have and how, uh, how that is structured and understand the traffic and, and understand the correlations there. And what, what's great about using Elasticsearch when you have really like a, a structure in Elasticsearch that makes sense to the business, not only to, to how Drupal wants to structure that, um, then you can simply enable Kibana for each of these projects and give a tool to your, to your users, to your content editors to really understand all the content and all the data that they have. And trust me, whenever you have large enough data sets, there's always a story and all these great insight that can be learned from that. Now we are actually getting to the, the beyond part of my presentation. And most of the examples that I showed you, it was a typical use case that you have Drupal and Drupal sends data to Elasticsearch and then Elasticsearch uh, is then searched and when you query it, it returns data. Um, and yeah, that works, but there's really nothing that says that these two operations need to happen this way. There's uh, an interesting trend that we've been seeing on a, on a lot of sites um, especially in the publishing sector, that there is one CMS that will push data to Elasticsearch, and then there's another instance that's a front end that will actually get the data. Um, and these are now the same systems. And actually, these don't need, even need to be the same te uh, technology. The front end could be built like a small Silex Symfony uh, application, maybe it could be Django. We've actually seen this. It could be uh, Node.js. And I think that, well, wh when we think of decoupled Drupal, we always think of Drupal and uh, REST service, uh, web service uh, that talks to some kind of JavaScript library, but that doesn't need to be the case. And actually, when you put Elasticsearch in the middle, it has a lot of advantages. Um, first, then you really actually have some actual decoupling. You don't need to have any Drupal-specific libraries in your front end. So that means that you can actually switch the front end uh, and swap it out with something else very easily. And if you want to, you can actually swap out the backend very easily as well. And Elasticsearch there in the middle provides uh, a system that is really, uh, really fast and that really gives you a huge amount of flexibility when it comes to querying, not for searching, but for getting any kind of data uh, and, and really uh, sorting that data by taking many parameters into consideration. But why stop there? I mean, Elasticsearch can get data from websites and CMSs, but hey, you know, if you want to go the, the whole internet of thing uh, way, yeah, you can have your devices, your toaster, uh, talk to Elasticsearch and get data from Elasticsearch. Um, to include a couple of buzzwords here, uh, you can have your Amazon Echo getting data from Elasticsearch or you even include that in, in a, a Facebook bot. This kind of stuff, um, it, it, you know, that's the future. And I think that Elasticsearch might be a better backend for these kind of needs than, than the, the, uh, the APIs that Drupal provides. So today, we are good at building websites. And I know we build web applications, we build web platforms and all of that, but really it's all stuff that opens in a browser. And there's something really interesting there at the inter intersection between websites and search, and that's what we're doing at the moment, but we shouldn't forget that there's a whole lot more beyond search uh, well, beyond the parts that we integrate in a site. And I think it's really important to focus on that part also, because that means that when websites will be less relevant, then we'll still have something important and relevant to do. So in summary, I think that there is an increasing, uh, well, that search is taking an increasingly central role in a lot of systems, in a lot of projects, a lot of websites. And if search matters to your project, it is the details that matter. You need to have the right adjustments in the right place to get a system that really creates a simple but powerful search experience.
And Elasticsearch actually has a really expressive API. And the challenge here is not learning the API. Actually, learning the API that everybody agrees, this is actually really easy. The challenge here comes with learning all the possibilities that you have with this API. <laughs> and how you can combine these possibilities to really create powerful search experiences. And finally, last but not least, Elasticsearch is really fun to work with. This is the most consistent feedback that I've gotten from everybody that I've talked to who has worked with Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is fun to work with. And that means that at the end of the day, when I come home after working on an Elasticsearch project, I'm happy. And that's a whole kind of, a whole new dimension of, of value generation compared to like, you know, my salary getting paid and our customers uh, being, uh, being rich. So it's, the, to me, this is really like what motivates me to, to come here and to talk to you about this way of doing things. I know it's very different from like what we've been taught, to, like, the, this, like the Drupal way of doing things. But it's something that really makes, uh, well, I think it makes a lot of sense, and it's really fun to work with. Uh, and uh, that's the reason why I think uh, you should definitely try it out. I'd like to thank all the people who have shared their project, their experiences, their challenges, their bugs, their frustration, their bug fixes with me. I know they learned a lot of stuff, and I'm really looking forward to hear about your project, about your challenges, of course, your bug fixes too. And I hope you learned something today. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, please, please come to the microphone. Yeah. So uh, a big question is uh, how Elasticsearch, uh, if it works with facets? So if you want to do filtering, extra filtering on the uh, search results, if it's working with facets or how you propose yes. them doing these things. <laughs> so I, I actually, from what I showed you, uh, most of, like pretty much all of these examples had custom code for the user interface. Maybe that was like Angular code, sometimes it was just like PHP code. Um, but actually a facet is two things. First, you provide the data to display the facet, and then when you click on that, then you just send a parameter that set, sets a filter. And the, what I showed uh, earlier with the, the Boolean that lets you specify multiple criteria, um, this is where you would be adding the filters that say, um, I'm searching for this keyword, and it should be in this category, and it should be in this date range, and, and so on. Uh, so you actually take the value that comes from selecting the facet, and then feed that into the query. But is uh, integrated with uh, facets module? No, it's no. not. So you have to do custom coding yes. in order to yeah. do this. OK, thanks. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if there's an ongoing effort or uh, any plans to integrate <coughs> your uh, Elasticsearch helper module with the um, other D8 Elasticsearch connector, which not only uh, also provides like search API mm -hmm. uh, pluggability, but also, I think, like views integration and such, so how is that going? I, th there are no plans at the moment. I think that the approaches are really different. So the, for example, Elasticsearch Helper, uh, the only configuration that it has is the, like, the server name uh, and any like, authentication. Uh, so it, I'm not sure that there's really much to be gained uh, from, uh, from that, uh, because like, most of the, the, the integration, that, like, well, the only thing that Elasticsearch Helper does is actually uh, put all the things that you need into one plugin instead of having that into a hook and uh, different places. So it, it acts on a very different level from a uh, search API, for example. Okay. Uh, so there's uh, the views integration you talked about is not in the Elastic Helper module, or? Uh, we, we are uh, going to put that back. So at the moment, it's in project-specific code, and we need to refactor that a little bit. Yeah. Thanks. The question is simple. Uh, how about uh, 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 accounting in Elasticsearch? Uh, Lucene had problem. I didn't try Solera, mm -hmm. but uh, I have problem similar as your on German site. A group of results should be counted. 
accounts should be displayed mm -hmm. and levels, levels, etc. Um, yes, so actually there, like Elasticsearch doesn't do like very exact things when it comes to counting. Um, but at the same time, I have to mention, I haven't like seen any issues even with really large data sets. So, I mean, it's, it's unprecise when you get into the millions of entries. Um, so it can be like, especially if you use it in distributed fa fashion, then you will have like different, like results from different charts that are then combined. Um, but it, Elasticsearch can actually tell you uh, if there is some error in term, like in terms of counting, but, um, in but like the kind of data sets that we see in the case of uh, a Drupal projects, I've never seen anything uh, that was really problematic. It should not be very large num number of data, mm -hmm. but it should be works in some kind. Mm, is it, sorry, it should uh, be. I, I do not have a large amount of mm -hmm. data. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, <coughs> I expect uh, it should work with Elasticsearch. Because that I want to switch to Elasticsearch, uh, I uh, have a main solution with uh, AP search, mm -hmm. API search, temporary. But uh, the problem is very complex, and search should be very, very complex. Yeah, yeah and I think that like the- Because the that Elasticsearch sorry, uh, looks very interesting for me, yeah. and right solution. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great, thanks. Okay. Thanks. Uh, one comment uh, that maybe people should know is that Elasticsearch and Solar actually run the same search library. Yeah. Which I think so. If you've been using Solar, I think, and you want to use Elasticsearch, you can apply a lot of the knowledge because the text uh, processing functionality, everything is actually the same. It's yeah. whether you configure it through the API or configure it through text file through XML files. Yeah. But yeah, maybe configuring it through the API is nicer sometimes. Yeah. Well, actually, I think there, there there's a, a lot of similarities in terms of like how stemming works and, and so on. But actually, one of the big differences is it for Solar, you specify everything through configuration files. Right. And then for Elasticsearch, that will be happening through the API. Right. So very much like when you uh, add a new, create a new table in MySQL, it is a query that creates the table. Um, so you can actually, like the way that you like submit that configuration is very different. And also like most of the fine adjustments that were needed uh, were like in specifying custom analyzers, custom languages, and Elasticsearch actually provides a lot of functionality on top that makes that a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So what you learned in the past will be helpful, but you probably won't need all of that. Sure. Um, <laughs> then I, I just had a question in terms of these implementations. Did you basically proxy the queries always through Drupal or how did you access Search API, um, since I assume like Solar, it doesn't really have any security built in. So mm -hmm. if you allow people access to it, they could just write their own data to it. Yeah, so th this is actually the, the, the first thing that comes to mind is like, oh, Elasticsearch has a REST API. Let's have JavaScript talk directly to it. Don't do that. Um, so Elasticsearch lets you do everything through the API, including like shutting down your cluster. So um, you, you actually always want to make sure that all your requests go through, so, through some kind of proxy that will check like user permissions, that will check authentication, and so on. Um, so yeah, th that's a very important point. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks for your presentation. I'm excited to, to try it out. Do you have um, like examples of the types of things that you've shown here somewhere available so we can try it out? Or is it just like Elasticsearch Helper, that's it? Well, I, actually, the, 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 the whole idea of Elasticsearch Helper is that it provides something that's really minimal. And the documentation that you should be reading is not the Elasticsearch Helper documentation, right. but the Elastic documentation, uh, okay. Elasticsearch documentation. By the way. Oh, I just have to read that book. So yeah. there's, uh, <laughs> yes. It, it <laughs> So um, um, there, there's uh, actually the, 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 the people at Elastic uh, have been very nice to send me uh, a couple of these books. This is the, uh, the definitive guide. You can actually find this on the website. So like, if you don't get a book or if you don't have space in your suitcase, you can still read that online. And the documentation is actually split into two parts. One of them is the reference that tell you all the details, like the name of the parameters and what values they take. And then there's the guide. And the guide actually tells you how the various things 
kind of fit together, and it gives you exactly that kind of like information. That how do you build like date aggregations? How do you like how should you index um, like things if you want to build an autocomplete? Uh, this kind of thing that's that's in here. Yeah. You want one? <laughs> he just doesn't want to carry them home. <laughs> no. yes. Was one more question? No. Okay. Yeah. If if you if you are really interested in in reading the book, uh, please come. We we have a couple. We also have a bunch of elastic stickers. If you want to put them on your on your laptop and be very proud, uh, yeah. Help yourself.